Good afternoon. I'm almost, uh, I feel guilty about breaking up this great conversation that all going on all around the room. Uh, this is one of my favorite days, uh, actually this whole week. If you, if you haven't noticed, there's been a little bit of a transformation of us and the campus over the last few days. Um, we've tagged the campus. We've had a, a number of events. We've actually tagged ourselves here. Um, and this is a, a, a very important time, I think, in our culture where we celebrate giving back. And it stretches from our students with the dance marathon. It's actually our athletes are actually contributing to the academic side of the institution. And then, of course, we have a whole week where we actually celebrate the entire community across the world and what they do for us. And, and honestly, in today's day and age, and I will not give you the whole lecture, but um, without benefactors to keep the l not only the lights on, but keep the people running, um, it just wouldn't happen. So this is a really, really important day. And we have a, a, a special guest speaker, which um, we'll introduce Sherry in a moment, but I'll just say um, she is, she's been a breath of fresh air in her entire life in so many different ways. And of course, she's had some, done some very interesting things. But like a lot of very interesting people, she's renewing and reinventing herself and doing some new things even as we speak. And it's this spirit of continual reinvention and reinvigoration that makes her such a breath of fresh air. And um, we'll hear from her in a moment, and maybe she'll tell me why I feel so strongly about her along the way, Sherry. <laughs> But I actually have a, a, a more important duty j just now in, in introducing another young lady, Rita Guzman. Rita's a junior here among us. And I just said to Rita, uh, are you in class? Because I started reading all of the things that she's doing. She's a marketing major and also focused on international business certificate and has a mi well be receiving a minor in Portuguese. But I don't know, either as, either as her day job or her night job, she's engaged in the Cultural Diversity Festival, University Global Buddies, the American Marketing Association, National Alliance for Mental Illness, the Tippy Build Program in partnership with the Habitat for Humanity, and the Tippy College of Business Global Internship Program, as well as a, a global ambassador in that program, and I could just keep going here. So I, I hope you're taking advantage of our study week <laughs> and calming down. But, and she's from Decora, and it gives me great pleasure to turn over the microphone to Rita. Thank you, Rita, for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, President Harold. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rita Guzman, and on behalf of the university, I'd like to thank you for being here today. By being in this room, you represent the spirit of Phil, which is short for philanthropy. I'm incredibly grateful to be part of this community. It is with the generosity of great people that makes this university thrive. I would like to take a moment to thank a key contributor to that success of Phil on our campus, Lynette Marshall, the president and CEO of the University of Iowa Foundation. Thank you, Lynette, for all your tireless efforts to help everyone at the university understand the power of giving. Thank you. Today, I have the honor of introducing a UI alumna who has dedicated her life to sharing stories. During her time as executive producer for the Oprah Winfrey Show, and more recently, the president of the Oprah Winfrey Network, she captivated audiences through her unique storytelling. She will continue her role as a storyteller in her endeavors with her own media company, fittingly named Story. As an alumna of the university, she has made sure to help the tell the story of students on campus. With her Women Who Lead scholarship, Sherry Salata has empowered many women on campus to share their talents. Her generosity has led me and others to continue our paths towards success so that we may one day give back to this university, just as she has. Without her kindness, I would not have been able to achieve many of the opportunities provided at the university. Her impact on students is something we should all strive for. Take a moment to think about how you got here, why you are here, and where you want to be in the future. 
Think of those who have helped you become who you are and have played a role in where you are going. To me, Sherry is one of those people who has led me along this journey. She is a fabulous example of someone who I want to be in the future. And ultimately, she embodies what it means to be Phil. Please join me in welcoming the president of the University of Iowa Foundation, Lynette Marshall, and our 2017 Life with Phil speaker, Sherry Salata. Thank you, Rita. That was terrific. I um, am delighted that you were able to help us today. And for those of you who haven't seen the uh, nice video that Rita did recently for us, you should watch for that on social media as well. We appreciate that very much. Thank you. Welcome home, Sherry. Thank you. What fun. <laughs> we'll make sure everyone can hear you. <laughs> Everyone, welcome back. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's so great to be here. I mean, I am so. What? What? What are you all doing here? I mean, <laughs> it's so. You know, it really, it is such an honor that you would make time out of your day to come and, and chat with us, and, and specifically me, and to welcome me like this. Um, I'm really touched by that. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. You tweeted earlier this week that you were looking forward to coming um, back to your favorite little town. Right? There's one of my sorority sisters. <laughs> <laughs> at the University of Iowa, my friends. Nice. Well, I love it. I mean, listen, I, um, I am a sentimental girl, and every time I hit Dubuque Street, I am, there's a little tear in my eye. And trust me, for all of those of you who are students right now, that feeling grows upon your departure. Right now, you're still a little, you've got some annoyances, and you've got, you know, finals coming, and you have this and that. But um, once you leave, uh, that's like most things in life. You start to realize the, the treasure of this experience here in Iowa City at the University of Iowa, that you right now are planting the seeds of the dreams that you are going to make come true for the rest of your life. And you don't necessarily connect it all until you're gone unless someone like me comes here and says, pay attention to this because you're going to feel really, 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 really differently. Years and years from now, you're going to look back and see that you were shaped here, that this is where it began, all those possibilities and all that potential. Tell us about how you got to the University of Iowa. How's, start your story for us. Well. Everybody in this room is a fantastic student and a leader with a real clear dream and real clear goals. That was not necessarily me. I was, I was a very good student in high school. I did not find it challenging. And what I really wanted was um, a great business card or an occupation. So I decided I was going to be a doctor. I liked my, my the sister, the, I went to a Catholic high school, the nun who, who taught biology. She was just a total sweetheart. And I really admired her, so I thought, you know, maybe it's the doctor thing. Maybe that's what I'm supposed to be. And that would be significant. I would be saving people every day and wearing a stethoscope and, you know, sauntering around in my, my white lab coat. And um, so, uh, but I also wanted to be roommates with my best friend from high school. We wanted to be roommates, and we were kind of dead set on it. And if you know, you know, t like teenage girls, that probably took precedence over a number of other factors and she and, and so we both applied to Illinois because I lived in Illinois and it would have been inspiration um, <laughs> and she didn't get in and I really think because she was super smart I really think that what happened is the universe kind of stepped in to kind of scoop me a different way so I had sent away for the the marketing brochure for the University of Iowa because back then a computer was the size of this room so you, you would get printed materials that would arrive via the mail in an envelope. And uh, the, the, the pictures were so gorgeous. Um, it was kind of like a river runs through it moment, if anybody remembers that movie, where there, uh, here was this idyllic campus that, and, and the sun hit the, the river just right. And there was something that looked mystical and maybe a little magical to me. And I thought, that is a place I can call home. And we both applied, we both got in, and the deal was set. And I, my first visit to the campus was when my parents dropped me off to go to school here. <laughs> it's 
So good thing. Good thing the brochure was right. <laughs> that would have been a real problem. So um, part of your story, certainly not all of it, but a big part of your story was connecting with Oprah. Yes. Talk about the beginning of that for us and then how you got to where you were before you started story. Yes, well, I mean, that obviously is the career lottery win of all time. <laughs> and half the world would pluck out their eyeballs to have had that, that ride. Um, but I didn't get there till I was 35. So as you are, and I say that to you to, to fire you up with all kinds of possibility that I, I did a lot of other jobs before I sauntered into Harpo Studios, you know, like um, feeling like I had won that lottery. Um, I, I had applied, I, I, you know, I was a 7-Eleven store manager. <coughs> I was in Dallas, Texas. I was in a, a toy store manager. I was a typist at a, at a title company and I wasn't a very good typist. Um, I, you know, I had lots and lots of jobs that, that um, I would go in and I would be, I'm like, okay, I, this doesn't feel right, but I'm going to be the best one they ever had. And I would get promoted and then I would realize, gosh, I'm not really happy. What, is, is this what I'm going to be doing when I'm 50? I mean, this does not feel right. So I had a lot of those experiences and um, I, I, I had my first big break by getting hired by my, that, that same high school friend I went to college with, her ex-fiance hired me to be his secretary at an advertising agency in Chicago. And uh, he trained me to produce radio, he trained me to produce television, commercials, and you know that's where I could feel it all starting to come together like, oh, this is, there, there, there's a little business sense here that I can apply to things. It's super creative. I feel a little glamorous. <laughs> you know, I can go to Hollywood and shoot a commercial and sit by the pool with my folders and my meetings. And um, there was something about it that felt like I, I was kind of home. Um, and, and then, in short order, like all, as all destiny unfolds, I was like, yes, but it's hairspray. <laughs> I'm working really hard. I'm up all night, but it's hairspray. And, and for me, the piece that was missing was that meaning piece. Like, where am I going to find that meaning piece? Like, th there's not enough of it. I need something to, like, really sink my teeth into and my heart into. Um, so I applied at the Oprah Winfrey Show to be a promo producer, and I got soundly rejected. I mean, literally told, you're not what we're looking for. And I was humiliated. And like, um, unlike many people in this room, I would not have gone back a second time. You know, the people who the people who really, you know, make their dreams come true, don't give up the first time. Well, I do. <laughs> I just give up. <laughs> That's it. It's over. I'm going to resign myself. Where's the hairspray? Bring it on. You know. Um, and I, I definitely felt so, some, you know, melancholy over that. Like, wow, it felt right. It felt like a soul calling. It felt like a a, a moment of destiny and. You know, I'm really surprised that that didn't work out. And, you know, so time goes by. And, you know, as I tell this story, it gets more dramatic. So who knows if I'm even exactly <laughs> right. But let's say it's somewhere, like, anywhere between 3 and 15 years. You know, some time goes by. And I'm feeling, personally, in my own life, I'm feeling kind of like, I'm feeling kind of like I'm kind of at a dead end. I don't have this figured out. Like, I thought I was onto something. It's you know, now I, like, I don't have enough money to pay my mortgage. Um, I'm in a real bind, in a real bind, and um, without a lot of light on the path. And, you know, I remember distinctly one day, and it probably was at a bar with Chardonnay and drinks, that I could feel myself let go of my need to be important. And I was just going to be like, I'm going to see how things turn out. I'm just going to let go of that need to push, 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 and it has to be right. And again, this is how I remember it now, but it was literally within days that I get this message on my answering machine that says, um, we were cleaning out an old closet and found your resume and your reel, and would you come to the Oprah show and freelance for us and do some commercials? And I remember thinking, oh, there's something more at play here in this life. There is a quantum 
vibrational field going on, and I just somehow found a way to tap into something. Let me keep going. Let me keep going because there's something else going on. And it had to do a little bit with like letting go of the outcome. It had to have a little bit to do with kind of trusting that the next right thing was going to come right in front of me, and I would kind of feel it. I was going to be able to feel my way to the next right thing, and it was okay that I owed my dad, like, I mean, at the time, it was probably $800, but it was like a lot. And, you know, it was okay that I, I couldn't figure it out yet, and it was okay that, you know, I was almost 35, which it was like, oh, brother, you know, I, my whole family is saying she used to have such promise. Um, <laughs> You know, it's like, I'm 35 and I'm the cautionary tale. Um, so it was like when I was really able to open my hands and, un and, and quit grasping at everything with sweaty palms, you know, or doing the, you know, the chair thing where you're like trying to get, make sure you at least have one chair instead of really getting into the flow of life and kind of following my happiness. And in that release, got the opportunity and it was such the right thing. It was such a meant to be. It was such a the right fit as I as my soul had felt like it was that, you know, it wasn't like, you know, climbing up the ladder, just things would happen and opportunities would come and will you do this? Yes, will you do that? My hands up. You know, what else can I do? How else can I serve? How else can I be a part of it? Because I could see that that experience wasn't about work and it really wasn't about a career. It was about becoming the human being I wanted to be. That that was going to be my path. That, that's how I was going to be exposed to the kind of spiritual life that I wanted to have. And the kind of conversations I wanted to be a part of. And the kind of doors I wanted to walk through. That it was going to be much more than a job for me. And I was determined to make it so. It seems like one of the things you're talking about that is perhaps a good reminder for all of us, is the chance to say yes, yes when opportunities come to us, right? We don't necessarily know where they're going to lead, but you kept saying yes. Yes. I did keep saying yes, and I think that has turned out to be one of the great decisions of my life that I pass on to all of you. That those yeses, like, like right off the bat, trying to protect your your time, and I don't know if I want to do that, is um, probably very limiting. Kind of like getting into that, that, that yes boat of, you know, who wants to try the, you know, within reason. Who wants to try this? I do. You know, who wants to work on this? I do. Who wants to be on, in this group? I do. Um, that yes thing is now a deeply ingrained habit within me. It's the way that I see the world, and it's because of all those millions of yeses that I said year after year after year after year. So this conversation today is yes. billed as yes. one thinking about philanthropy. And mm -hmm. you have been a philanthropist yourself, and you've also had the opportunity to learn from, you know, one of the most remarkable philanthropists Indeed. in the world. Tell us about learning about philanthropy from Oprah. Well, the thing that I, I, I can reveal is that most of Oprah's philanthropic efforts were never public and won't ever be public. No one will ever know the degree to which um, she made um, sharing um, a way of life. And I took note, I watched every bit of that, and I, I went, that is, that, me too, yes. Yes, 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 me too, that's who I wanna be. I want to be so successful and I want to have so much influence and so many resources that I can say yes a lot of times, you know, when it comes to that. Um, you know, that one of the great gifts of that experience was I never, I was never in a big search for, for meaning or mission. That was kind of a company benefit, like vacation days and health insurance. You know, it was always about, I mean, every day it would be like, what's our intention? It's like, oh, well. <laughs> Okay, you know, like we, we always had to have the deeper thing going on and we always had to like really have, you know, an audience and our viewers and focus and care about um, their well-being and their upliftment and um, illuminating stories that would make a difference in their lives. So, you know, you can kind of like after a while, I'm like, wow, I don't even really have to do anything else. All my boxes are checked. 
So um, that was very um, life-changing for me. So Rita talked a little bit about the support that you have provided through um, your scholarship here. Talk a little bit about how you came to that decision, establishing Jenna. that. <laughs> <laughs> Dean Sarah Gardial, um, Jane. Um, hmm. Well, listen, um, thank you. And thank you for calling me a philanthropist. And like, we should all be feminists, we should all be philanthropists. Um, but it's a very, it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a drop in the ocean and it, it connects me to Rita and it connects me back to myself when I was Rita's age. And I, you know, it was only years and years, years later, I, I could see how fortunate I was that my mom and dad had the resources to take care of it. So I could literally take the whole thing for granted, <laughs> you know, until years later when I had some sense. Um, so it's kind of like one of those yes, yes things for me. Um, you know, when we talk about philanthropy, I, I feel I'm going to be a bit of a disruptor here. And I'm going to tell you that here's what I see as somebody who tells stories. And, and there's a story about philanthropy, too. And oftentimes, the word philanthropy is the story of you have to cut a check and you have to give up your weekends and go do volunteer work. And, and, and that is the, the beginning and, and the end to that story. And for many of us who can't write a check or don't have a weekend to give, we can't be a part of that uh, story of philanthropy. So knowing that I was going to be up here with Lynette, who's very, very wise, I decided to look up what it meant to philanthropy, <laughs> so I wouldn't get I wouldn't get stuck in an awkward situation. But you know, can you ever imagine this woman <laughs> in an awkward situation? <laughs> oh, please, millions of times. Um, so philanthropy, the definition I like the best is the betterment of humankind. And so this is the disruptive piece that I, I share with all of you. Give it some thought. See if it works for you. The betterment of humankind begins with your own life and your own self. So I would say if you, if you want to start on a road to philanthropy, don't be off-put if you can't write a check. And don't be off-put if you don't have a weekend to volunteer. But maybe it starts with being a little kinder to yourself. And maybe it starts with being more deeply appreciative of your own gifts and telling yourself a different story about yourself. And in that way, I feel like we, become, we become people who inspire. That when you are telling yourself that story and you're, and you're taking care of your own betterment and your own upliftment, you begin to become a person that is impacting people from every, every corner of your life. And you will never, ever know exactly where that goes. But as you continue to tend to that, you, you tend to draw people to you who are like-minded in that search for upliftment and betterment. And pretty soon, you know, things are going your way. And pretty soon, you know what? You have an opportunity that, is, that creates abundance for yourself, that creates time for yourself. And pretty soon, you know what you say? You know what? I, I'd like to pay for that. Or I would like to participate in that. Or I have time for that. Or that may, that'd be a great thing for me to do. Um, it's a journey. It doesn't have to start at the end. You know, and I think at, at the end of the day, if you begin that, that the real wide open door and the easy point of entry is peace begins with me. Kindness begins with me. Sharing begins with me. And so when I walk into a room, I'm reminding myself, all the time, that what I have to give the most is my energy. What I have to give th the most is really like my most, um, my brightest light. And everything else feels kind of small next to that. You have a wonderfully bright light. <laughs> Thank you for sharing it with us today. And that leads me to thinking about, and, and I'd love to hear some more about your new company. Yeah and the pillars that you're building that on. Yes. Um, your partner, Nancy Halla. Yes, Nancy Halla is one of my greatest friends of 26 years. Her daughter, Olivia, sitting right in the front row, is also a senior at the University of Iowa, um, along with, <laughs> yay! 
<laughs> she's graduating too. And, and Lexi Wright, who's mine. Um, well, you know, here's the thing. So Nance and I are in, are in what some would call midlife, if we're all going to live to be 100, which I'm counting on. And, you know, you, you will find, and we're blazing a trail for you, so you can, you can thank me at the end of this, this talk. Um, you're going to find yourself where your children are raised, or you've had, like, really quite a brilliant career, or you have found a cure for something, or you invented something that changed everything, and then you're going to have a decision to make. What's next? Are you going to wait to get a call to babysit the grandkids? Are you going to, you know, take a step back because your time is over now? Um, it's not about you anymore? Or are you going to take a look at your life and say, hey, I've got a lot more dreams to make come true. There are a lot, there's a lot more that I want to do, and now's the time for me to get to doing it. So our whole company is founded on it's, it's called Story. It's a, it's a media company. Um, we have lots of great projects, but here's what we do. What we want, with who we want, when we want, and where we want. And that is the beauty of midlife, my friends. That is, <laughs> <laughs> that is you don't want to get old? Oh, come on. You know, it's good. It's good, you know, when, when you decide that you can be the master of your fate and the captain of your soul, and you can make those decisions. So, um, we have pillars in our company, which are health and wellness, um, uh, relationships, uh, um, family and friends, um, uh, spirituality and happiness. Um, and, and we defined all those pil pillars, and they're as much a part of our company as anything else, as wheeling and dealing and anything else. So that said, we have, um, we sold a, I've sold a memoir to Harper Collins, Harper Wade, to Harper Collins. That'll come out in May of 2018, and it's about precisely what I'm talking about. It's this year of saying, okay, looking across the landscape of my life, I've had a lot of big dreams come true that began for me right here in Iowa City, but I still have about 30 or 40 or 50 more to make come true, and so I am in earnest about that, um, that very thing. I love this story of when you got to Los Angeles, right? So you grew up in the Chicagoland yes. area, and you've been working in Chicago yes. and around the world, yes. but headquartered in Chicago. And then when was it that you moved to L.A.? I moved to L.A. 14 months ago, full time. And you got there, we're going to the Rose Bowl here, dear. Oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was like, yeah, <laughs> Linda. Um, well, yeah, because, you know, it was so weird. The timing was so perfect. It was like the Rose Bowl was being thrown for me. <laughs> it, was like my, it was like my welcome to L.A. I literally, I think, did we drive up, was it two days before? And next thing you know, I was in the arena uh, with, the, with the big party thing. And, yeah, it was, yeah, it was really something. It was, and it felt faded, which is why I couldn't quite believe we didn't win. I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God, and we're going to win the Rose Bowl. But that's okay. I had a great time. <laughs> Everything was fun but the game. That's what we keep saying. <laughs> it's a great party except for the game. Yes. So let's go back to story. Yeah. And um, got your memoir that you're yes. working on and that will come out in about a year. So yep. we'll all look forward to that. Mm -hmm. What about some of the um, television and other media kinds of projects that you can talk about? Yeah. So um, I also founded a company just because I wanted to with um, – great friends uh, who are television stars, and um, we optioned a memoir uh, called The Gilded Razor by Sam Lansky, and we're in development right on that right now for a scripted series, and honestly, I'm doing it because I want to, and everybody feels the same way. Um, my my co-founder, Nancy, and I, and uh, Nate Berkus and Jeremiah Brent, we just sat down at dinner one night and said, you know what, let's do some projects. Maybe let's do some projects, and, and things seem to be lining up very nicely on that. And it's really, we want to tell the stories we want to tell. We want to tell stories that are interesting and kind of shine a light on something and, you know, add to the conversation. And, you know, that's, that's what I'm about. We look forward to all of that. Thank you. We'll, we'll keep watching for that. Thank you. But, you know, here, here's, you know, in, in, in the end, because 
all those things are great. And there's something in development, and it sounds really fancy and all that, but, and it's great, and it's super fun, and it's nice when you sell a book, and it's nice when you sell a TV series, and um, that's really, really, really fun, and the champagne is poured, and, you know, many times over. But the real joy for me right now in, in this chapter of my life is recognizing this that I have not stopped being a dreamer. That if you can understand that at 20 or 21 years old, that you have a fundamental decision to make about who are you gonna be on this path? Are you gonna be a lifelong dreamer? Are you gonna be like literally calling down the thunder as you walk down this path and going boom, making this come true for yourself and boom, making that come true for yourself and then saying, what else do I wanna do? How about that? And are you going to be that inspiring person that teaches other people how to dream too? Are you going to take your kids with you on that ride? Are you going to take your friends with you on that ride? When, when you walk in a room, are people are going to, are they going to say, I want some of that? Because that really is the fuel to making your own dreams come true. Once you realize you have this little dream engine and that that's really what you're about, you really are. The end game is happiness. So it doesn't happen 10 years from now. It doesn't happen 20 years from now. I did not know that when I was a senior in college. I thought it came with all that other stuff. It's right this minute. This is the moment where you decide to be happy, and this is the moment where you decide, I'm a dreamer. That's who I am. That's going to be my, my archetype. That's going to be my suit of clothes. That's going to be how I move through the world because I wa really want to be able to manifest the greatest, most delicious, brilliant life that's possible for me. That's nice, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Does, doesn't everyone want a piece of that? Yeah. <laughs> so you spent a lot of time working really hard. Yes. Um, you described different jobs that you had yes. and in some of the um, articles that you've, uh, about you, that have been written, you've talked about working 80 and 90 hour yeah. weeks, and you've also talked about making decision to not do that. Yeah. So how do you come to that balance? What's, what's um, I, I'm not sure that I believe in work-life balance. I like the idea of recovery because <laughs> um, Grim. We, we work, you know, very hard and then yeah. need to recover, but yeah. Tell us a little bit about the, the um, challenge of not getting into that 80 or 90 hour week. Well, I would never say I'd do anything differently because that's really quite pointless. Um, so here's another disruptive thought that I'm, I've been toying with for several years now. I don't believe in work-life balance and because I, I, I failed at it for you know, a quarter of a century. Um, so I just decide simply not to believe in it and that it, I make that go away. But, <laughs> <laughs> as I often do in many things. Um, but think of the concept of balance. It's a place you're getting to that you never quite arrive at, that you're always kind of off and whoa, there it goes again. It so it, it is kind of a recipe for, for failure. Like mentally, emotionally, you're never gonna have it down, you're never gonna get it. Um, unless you like really dial it down so you're almost not doing anything, you, you really can't quite ever achieve it. It's just not achievable. So I have stricken that from my vocabulary, from any kind of, um, any dream I have for myself. And what I say is this, if you can look at your life like a landscape and, and not be putting everything in drawers, your love life goes in a drawer, your, your family life goes in a drawer, your work life goes in a drawer and then you just pull it out and you take care of that and put it away and like you're paying bills or something. So if you, if you look at it like a landscape and you kind of see the whole of it from, from a higher point of view and you, you use your intuition, your heart, um, your, your sense of vision to kind of move through your landscape in a way that makes you happy. And for me, there were a lot of years that working 80 or 90 hours a week made me enormously happy. I wanted a seat on that bus. I wanted to be in that worldwide conversation. I wanted to be, um, you know, in the middle of it. 
and I got, I, I soaked up every bit of juice I could from that experience. And now I say, okay, let me take a look at my landscape. Wow, there's some areas I haven't seen for a while. <laughs> you know, and now I have a chance to say, okay, so recalibrating and tweaking my own philosophy of how I look at my own life, how can I like, how can I really flow through it and have, and make the rest of those dreams come true? and still have creativity and innovation and accomplishment and what I call, what I now know as success, which is really that meaning piece. So um, I'm, I'm taking a different tact at it and I, and I offer it up to you in that, um, that kind of look at it, you, you start out a little bit more successfully. You don't set, set yourself <coughs> up for um, continual failure to deliver. Good, thank you. We are um, going to take some questions from the audience, but before we do that, so get, get your ideas ready for your questions. Before we do that, um, you've been coming back to the University of Iowa for a while. I have. And you talk about um, getting emotional when you come on to Dubuque Street. Mm -hmm. It occurs to me though, um, myself, knowing what it was like to experience the University of Iowa through my daughter's eyes, that you have that as a different experience as yeah. well Lexi. now for Lexi oh, talk about and you. also for um, Nancy's and, and for experience Olivia. with Olivia. I'd love to hear what it's like um, seeing your alma mater through um, the well, eyes of a mother. Well, they would go through their eyes ever so slightly because I'm like, don't you love it? Don't you love it? Isn't it the greatest? <laughs> Aren't you having the best time of your life? And they're like, a um, <laughs> little bit. I know myself. Maybe a lot. <laughs> I know myself. <laughs> I do know myself. Um, well, here's what I think. What I think when I see people that I love so much walking the, the, these streets and having this experience and sitting in this front row feels like a real full circle moment, doesn't it, Liv? Doesn't it, Lex? <laughs> Livy, I, 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 you know, I held her in my arms two days after she was born, you know, and she's graduating from, you know, my favorite university on the planet in a couple weeks, which is something, right? And there is Lexi, who is taking advantage of everything that this university has to offer, and I'm so proud of her. And she is a year away from graduating from college here at the University of Iowa that I love so much. So I have a graduation to look forward um, coming up here very shortly, and then next year another one, and I'll just have to find somebody else to follow. <laughs> Yes. Rita and all the women who follow her, right? Yes. Well, right. here's the thing. When I talk about, like, what did you do when you were here? And I'm like, well, there was the field house, the airliner. <laughs> Red Stallion was in Coralville. I had a very active social life. I knew where, at least, you know, where I knew where all the, where the specials were. And I really, it was just about the dancing. <laughs> All right, how about some questions? Why don't you stand up and introduce yourself, if you would. So hi, my name is Jacob Gordon. Hi, Jacob. Freshman, You're a freshman. what? You're a freshman? Yes. Wow. So what is your best mistake that you made? <coughs> That's a good question. What is the best mistake? Hmm. <coughs> oh my god, you stumped me. <laughs> Um, the best mistake I ever made, <laughs> listen, it probably worked out really well that I had absolutely no plans after I graduated to do anything. It probably worked out well for me, and it is not for anybody else. <laughs> it, is <laughs> <laughs> it is a terrible path, and it is a real recipe, but um, the best mistake I ever made was probably having a lot of bites at the apple leading up to my moment of destiny. Because what happened for me is when I got there, I knew what it was. I was like, oh, this is a moment, and I will not waste a second of it, and I will appreciate every nanosecond of this experience. But I'm not sure I had the emotional maturity to do that without having some really dark and dismal years trying to f discover what it was. Is that good? <laughs> Who else? Yes. Hi, Jenny. Uh, I'm Julie. I'm a freshman student at the Chicago Grand City. So my question to you is, um, when you say you say yes to everything, but did you ever have those times when you felt that something is beyond your, you, you don't have enough time to say yes to everything? 
-hmm. Yes. That is an excellent question, and basically you have trapped me in a lie. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's, <laughs> here's what I have to say to you about that. There was a really long time where I said no, no, no. And that was probably when I was the executive producer of The Oprah Show. I put myself in a concrete bunker and no one was allowed in or out, and here's why. Because everybody had, if I could just get my book to Oprah, if I could just get my screenplay to Oprah, so I like didn't hardly go anywhere or do anything because I found that difficult to be like, no, 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 no. So, so I did not say yes to everything, everything there, but and with good reason. Um, now I say yes to everything and I say yes to most things. So it might be slightly hyperbolic, <laughs> but what it is, I think the, the, the larger takeaway there is there is a spirit of openness to the, the beautiful possibilities the universe is dropping at your feet. And all of us can walk through life looking at our phones, you know, scrolling through Facebook or Snapchatting, um, which I don't really know how to do. Um, and you're missing those precious moments that are being laid right at your feet that really is the one thing you're dreaming of or the, the, the beginning of the trail to the one thing you're hoping for. So. So that, that idea of, Shonda Rhimes wrote a great book about it, you know, her year of yes. And that's a really great book for ev anybody in this room to read, which was, she was a person very shy, said no a lot, she's super successful, everybody wants something from her. And she decided out of this shyness, she was gonna take a year and say yes, and it transformed <coughs> her life. What I'm saying is, there's a way of moving through the world where you're on the treasure hunt and your eyes are open and you're smiling at the people, other people on the path, and not avoiding them. <laughs> Great question. You're welcome. Thank you. Who's next? Hey, Terry, thanks again for, for making this happen. I'm sitting yeah. um, with Connor. Hi, and Connor. I've seen this book that I wrote in a, uh, a couple weeks ago. But uh, my question is, growing up in the Midwest and having the opportunity to travel the world, what kind of global perspective did you gain, and then how have you seen Yeah. Well, let me be, let me maybe again bring some, shed some light and some truth on my, the, the students I had breakfast with this morning are more well-traveled than I am. <laughs> so um, as they were talking about all their travels, I was like, I need to get out and do something. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been to Dublin. Um, here's what I think about the Midwest. How many people are from the Midwest in here? Okay, because I want it to be an inclusive conversation. <laughs> Midwest is great. <laughs> and here's why. There is a, there's a heart-centered sensibility you grow up with where you do what you say, you say what you mean. Um, there is a, there's a cultural kindness that is unique to this part of the world. There's a realness and a, and a generosity and a genuineness and an authenticity that's special. And, and other parts of the country have their own gifts, but I feel incredibly lucky, and I know it's a huge piece of everything I've gotten to do that I was baked. I was baked right in the heart of America. Um, I know who I am, and I know what I want, and I know who I want to be because of that, for sure. But if you're from California, you're good, too. <laughs> <laughs> Another question, yes. Hi, Sherry, I'm Jack Barr. I'm a second year junior, and not all that credit is going to that. So oh, okay. <laughs> okay, that sounds like a story. <laughs> but uh, you, we're talking about, like, you got a lot of jobs before yes. you found the, the yeah. radio and then, like, the working remote. Mm -hmm. so Yeah, no, I totally did. I mean, I, you know, when I was finally at 7-Eleven and it, it, I'd had a bunch of different retail jobs and, you know, it was like I was at the toy store, you know, and the semis are coming with the stuffed toys and the Masters of the Universe and the Cabbage Patch dolls and I'm like, you know, mothers are batting me over the head with their purses and I'm like, oh my God, this cannot be my life. 
And I was in the 7-Eleven training program, which actually I didn't realize that you had to learn how to run a store. <laughs> so that was, you know, like eight really grueling months of that and this and that. So, and everybody's dream, and this is when 7-Eleven in Dallas was very corporate, and everybody wanted to get to the glass tower on the expressway. So you'd be like, you didn't be standing there in your smock cleaning your slurpy machine saying, someday I'm going to have an office in that glass tower. That's <laughs> going to be me. So the day that uh, my, uh, my and, I, and I was then running stores and I had a, a group of stores and I was like, okay, I hope this gets better at the glass tower because <laughs> this, this is not feeling like the dream. And my boss called me in and said, we're going to consider you for a district training manager role, which I know sounds very exciting. <laughs> and, and, and indeed it was. It was very exciting, and it was uh, the road to the glass tower. And as I sat there, and he literally gave me the news that I had worked now maybe three or four years to here, every day, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, um, I said, get out of the Kleenex. And I said, I'm quitting. <laughs> <laughs> I have to quit. Two weeks notice, I'm going home. <laughs> because I had a flash of myself at 60, which I'm knocking on that door pretty soon, of sitting in the glass tower, being the district training manager, and thinking, oh no, that, that is not going to be the answer for me. Now, here's the truth. It was the answer for somebody else who would be fantastic at it and would fulfill that mission like with great verve and a sense of accomplishment and meaning. It just was not right for me. So that was, that was the big moment. And it was like I was 27 and I had no money again. I had to come home, back to you know the northern suburbs of Chicago with my tail between my legs. My parents are like, well, no, we're not worried. Is everything OK? <laughs> are, are you ever going to be able to support yourself? <laughs> and I had my dog, and then went I had to live in the basement. And that's a really long story. But it, it looked grim. It looked real grim. Like, it's like this is not turning out, and this is this is, this is not the dream. And I could feel that everybody was really worried that I was not going to make it. Like, I was not going to succeed. I was going to make it. I mean, I could go and get another job at 7-Eleven, but that I was not going to find my way. That was it. Yes. Hi, Terry. I'm Andrew and Mandy. Thanks Hi. For doing this. Hi, Andrew. Uh, if you could, think back to some of the most favorable colleagues and coworkers that you've had. In oh, yeah. Well, it is a relationship game, this game of life. Mm -hmm. And whether you are a college student, whether you are working in a department, whether you have your eyes set on running a television network or running a university or, or anything else, it's a relationship game. You know, your whole life is going to be about relationships. So here is you know, a discovery that I've made, you know, the people who like really added, like, or, or really inspired me to up my game were people that were uplifters. They took themselves and their own happiness really seriously. And it looked like, and, and they inspired me to do the same. They were people that really took seriously how they came into a situation or, or a room. They were determined to be additive. Um, and they were um, muscularly positive. They were always willing to see the glass half full of lemonade and how can we fill it up some more. And those are the people that were magnetic for me. Those are the people I wanted to be like. Um, and so now I find myself in this catbird seat of really only being having to deal with anybody that I want to deal with. And I find that same litmus test to be true. I want to be with the dreamers. I want to be with the illuminators. I want to be with the people who want to be the light. I want to be with the people who have a bigger dream. I want to be with the people who say, you know what, not everything's perfect, but oh my gosh, what a ride this life thing is. What fun this is. What a great time this is. And you know, those are the people that are, are going to be on my train, and that's the train I want to be on, and deciding making that decision for yourself, like what train are you getting on? 
really is going to determine your day in and day out quality and experience of life. No question about it. Because I've also taken some rides on the complaining train. <laughs> and I can tell you, it, it comes to no, no good. You know, you just end up feeling like, yeah, everything's terrible. You know, it's never going to work out. You can't create, you can't dream, you can't manifest, you can't lead from that train. One more question. You're welcome. Hmm. Okay, so I will say that I don't know that I was the best all the time, but I was determined to be the best, to find the best in myself in any given moment. And it was also kind of a bit of a delay as well, <laughs> because I would stay at things that weren't quite right way too long, because being the at the best being and doing the best was more important than my own happiness. I, I'd tweak that little recipe just a little bit, because happiness needs to be your compass. And then once your happiness is your compass, and, and you're really following that from a real feeling place, then in any given moment, I wanted, I wanted to know when I went home at night, or, um, and specifically as it relates to work, um, that I left it all on the table, that I, I, I didn't, I, I wasn't chintzy with my employer. I didn't like saying, yeah, this is all you're gonna make. You know, I really, I would leave it all there as best I could. Thank you. Anything you'd like to conclude with, Sherry? <coughs> well, who wants to sign up for the Dream Tribe with me? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I say. Who wants to sign up for the Dream Tribe? <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. So nice. You have um, inspired so many of us <laughs> through the years, and we learn a lot from you. Thanks we so really much. learn a lot from you. Thanks for Thanks um, that. not only supporting students here, but for giving of your time and your energy. You've hosted people um, at your company, and it's been um, a really wonderful way for us to come to know you and for you to share your life with these folks. So please join with me in thanking okay. Sherry. <laughs> with Phil. <laughs>